Hello everyone, Thunderbro here, and recently I've caught up to Game of Thrones. And the awesome battle scenes and the plethora of boobies aside, one of the most interesting aspects of Game of Thrones is how every major player vying for a position of power approaches attaining that power, and the differing reasons why they go after it. Some are looking to safeguard the position of their house, some are going after what they see as their birthrights, some believe that they would be the best for Westeros, some strive for independence, and some for more idealistic reasons. And I find discourse on who is the best and most suitable leader to be quite interesting. So that got me to thinking how Gintama could compare to this aspect. Of course Gintama has nothing on the scale of the political squabbling of Game of Thrones, and obviously it doesn't share that free-for-all battle royal nature that Game of Thrones has. You're either anti-Tendosho or pro-Tendosho in the world of Gintama, and several main cast members aim to take Gintama's Japan in a different direction from the one it's on in most of the show. Most are rebelling against the Tendosho in one way or another, so I want to break down the specific approaches of the major players in Gintama and how they go about freeing Gintama from the grasp of the Tendosho. Now some of the characters I'm about to mention are dead, but I'll be discussing how those characters would have fit as leaders of the nation if they survived. And of course, I'm anime only, so I'll be covering the events of Gintama up to the end of the Rocky arc. The characters I'll be discussing are Tokugawa Shige Shige, Katsura Kotaro, Takasugi Shinsuke, Tokugawa Nobunobu, and Sasaki Asaburo. And first, Shige Shige. Now Shige Shige would have definitely been an obvious choice. While he began as a puppet of Sada Sada, he eventually branched out on his own and started formulating his own ideology and sense of honor. He began to leave the comfort of Edo Tower in order to actually get an understanding of what his country is like and how people in Edo lived. Unfortunately, through a combination of bad luck and his own obliviousness, this didn't always turn out dandy for him. But nonetheless, he forged a bond with several people within Edo and began to sympathize with and understand the common people as he continually immersed himself in their world. Even from an early age, Shikishige was confronted with the grim realities of being a leader, as he gripped with the guilt of several other children dying to keep him alive. So from the get-go, Shikishige was never a social elitist, and his sense of justice and sympathy for other people emerged early in his life. This means Shikishige's people skills, skills in diplomacy, as well as mercy and understanding, was a huge plus of his administration and, of course, the man himself. He would have connected with the people like few other potential leaders in Japan could have and would have been a valuable bridge between the world of the elite and the common folk, as he immersed himself in the life of both of those social classes and made genuine friends and allies on both sides of the divide. And of course, when the chips are down, Shige Shige does have the capacity to play politics and make the right maneuvers to take down his enemies. If the Tendosho didn't try to root him out, he had the potential to change the corrupted system from within and make life under the Tendosho livable for humans. Now the one major issue with Shige Shige is how his trusting nature was essentially his downfall. Shige Shige's sense of honor especially with allies, unfortunately left him vulnerable and Hitotsubashi took advantage of that. During the preparations for the rebellion to take back his shogunate, he welcomed his retainers and allies with no guards in the vicinity and clearly without proper security measures, under the assumption that all those who swore loyalty to him could be trusted, which created an opening for the Hitotsubashi to be rid of Shige Shige once and for all, and if this assassination never took place, who's to say a similar opportunity in the future couldn't be exploited by his enemies? and that trusting nature could have ended up compromising him or his forces. The second issue with Shige Shige potentially being the leader is that if he remained in the setup of being the Shogun, obedient to the Tendosho, creating a more just society for humans could be an extremely slow process. Now there are a lot of good Amanto in the series, but also a lot of nasty ones. We all remember that frog guy who had the gall to insult Kondo after he had taken a bullet to save his life, or the douchebag Katamantos who picked on Shinpachi in episode 3. There is a sentiment of discrimination and hatred in Gintama that won't exactly go away overnight and good luck trying to convince disgruntled humans and Joey Shishi to warm up to the Amanto who took over the planet. So this process could take decades to be successful, and that's if Shige Shige doesn't get punished by either side for trying to bring people together. With all this in mind, Shige Shige would be the most benevolent and well-intentioned leader for the nation, but his trusting nature gives opposing factions several openings to dismantle what he built, and his middle ground approach would likely be the most lengthy of methods of change with a possibility of being unsuccessful. So many might not have the patience for it. Katsura Kotaro now, Katsura would not be a bad choice to lead Japan. Ever since the Joey War ended, he has dedicated himself to liberating Japan from the grasp of the Tendosho Coalition through consistent resistance and guerrilla warfare. What makes Katsura stand out is his rather moderate stance on the Yamato presence in Japan and his aversion to all-out warfare, despite the traumatic events leading up to the death of Yoshida Shoyo. Katsura fights the Tendosho but is clearly not a human exclusionist and does not see himself as better than the aliens that now inhabit his nation. His second-in-command and arguably his best friend is Elizabeth, an Yamato of the Renho tribe. A tribe which is one of the many factions that have tried to exert control over Earth throughout the series. Katsura also has an immense respect for Kagura, who is a Yato. It's clear through his close friendships that Katsura fights for the end of the Tendosho, but not the expulsion of all Amanto. Katsura also has a lot of respect for the soldiers in his employ and attempts to avoid excessive losses of life in battle. 
During the Joey War, he was known as Katsura the Runaway for his use of strategic retreats and for not sacrificing his soldiers for a slim chance of victory. His regard for his men was once again shown in Rakio, where he created a diversion to let his soldiers, including Elizabeth, advance so he could take on the monstrous Neptune Shokuku alone. And Katsura just barely beat Neptune in that fight, so imagine how many guys would have been slaughtered trying to take Neptune down. Katsura does have two glaring flaws. The first is his knack for putting himself in compromising positions and taking huge risks in the actions that he takes. He puts on flimsy disguises and appears at public events and even appears on television sometimes. And he even infiltrated the Shinsengumi with only an afro. Takasugi is a Joey rebel just like Katsura, but Takasugi hardly ever makes public appearances and he does not participate in ridiculous televised or publicized events. So his likelihood of getting compromised is very low. Katsura is lucky he's a master of escape, but that doesn't mean he should keep throwing himself into dangerous positions for little to no reward. This wouldn't really affect his governance, but he's risking cutting his own career as a leader short by constantly putting himself out in the open. The second of Katsura's issues is Katsura's supposed insecurities. As shown by the arc where he recruits a shogun who appears to have amnesia, and being outsmarted or upstaged does not sit well with Katsura. And this could potentially hamper his ability to lead, and it possibly could diminish some of his respect. Regardless, ideologically, Katsura would be a sound pick for Gintama's Japan. He doesn't believe in unnecessary violence, and he treats his men with respect, and he's a rather tolerant man. And at the same time, he has the firepower, the personal strength, the numbers, and the bravery to defend the nation and his ideology. He would only need to be careful not to leave himself open to his enemies, and end up cutting his leadership short, and he needs to handle personal losses better. Takasugi Takasugi, like Katsura, has a similar aptitude for leading his men into battle, and he garnered a serious reputation for his bravery and tactics during the Joey War. While during times of war and during battles he could possibly be the best choice, when it comes to leading the nation, Takasugi has a few problems. Takasugi being a Joey rebel, he of course had the interests of Japan in mind, but the difference between him and Katsura is Takasugi will stop at nothing to dismantle the Tendosho, even if it means causing widespread destruction and panic throughout Japan. Takasugi is more of an all or nothing kind of leader, willing to resort to almost any tactic in order to be a thorn in the Tendosho and Bakufu's backside even allying himself with the infamous space pirates, the Harusame, and even forging an alliance with the Hitotsubashi, which itself is a branch of the ruling Tokugawas, and all this just to get an edge on the Bakufu. Takasugi's over-eagerness to topple his government at all costs has proven to be disadvantageous at times, since the Hitotsubashi betrayed the Kiyotai after they got what they wanted, and the Harusame also eventually turned on the Kiyotai as well. Takasugi's means to an end actions can unfortunately leave the Kiyotai vulnerable to exploitation and betrayal. And despite him coming to his senses later on after reconciling with Gintoki, Takasugi's vengeful attitude and violent nature means he could end up making impulsive and irrational decisions that are not beneficial in the long run. Katsura experienced the exact same trauma in the Joey War as Takasugi, but the hatefulness did not consume Katsura in the same way, as Katsura eventually gained a moderate stance as stooping to the Amanto's level to him would make the Joey Rebels no better than them. And this isn't to say that Takasugi is evil. He's not. We saw in the Rakyu arc that he cares about his soldiers, and he even has a sense of honor towards his enemies, as shown with the end of his fight with Obro. However, as of the Rakyu arc, the majority of his decisions have been extremely dangerous towards the nation, and his willingness to sacrifice the nation itself to achieve his goals is not a good long-term strategy to take the country forward. Nobunobu Now, Nobunobu hardly deserves to even be on this list, but since he's one of the guys openly vying for power in the series, I felt it necessary to include him. So from his introduction, Nobunobu wants to be the Shogun. Now, we know that the Hitotsubashi lean more towards independence, but Nobunobu put the interests of himself and his family before the nation. We know that he attained personal power through rather bloody means, and he showed egotistical and dominating tendencies throughout the series, shown through his merciless treatment of hostesses at Club Smile and his blatant disrespect and disregard for his soldiers and anyone else that allies themselves with him. And he also sold out to the Tendosho in order to become Shogun and has seemingly abandoned the political alignment of the Hitotsubashi. He switched roles with Shige Shige instead of leading Japan to a more independent state as his family seemed to have intended. So all these things have proven Nobunobu to be selfish and utterly oblivious to the plight of the nation and its people. He had a little bit of a moral turnaround in the Rakyo arc after encountering Sakamoto, but that doesn't negate everything he's done, and so far the extent of his change is yet to be seen. And finally, Isaburo. So Isaburo had one of the more elaborate plans in Gintama for the sake of the nation. He decided to play the long con and play the Tokugawa, Hitotsubashi, and Tendosho off of each other to try and completely dismantle the current system and start Japan anew. Now this isn't a bad plan. Isaburo sees that the current setup of the state of Japan was bound to fail no matter who controlled the nation. 
I think he realized this when the Tokugawa and the Tendosho tried to get him to let the Hitotsubashi nobles be killed, with the Shinsengumi taking the fall for it. He ran the Mimoregumi under the illusion that they were loyal to the Hitotsubashi, but Isaburo had much grander ambitions than serving any one faction. Isaburo should get points for a strategic play in siding with the Hitotsubashi, who throughout the series only grew stronger and more dangerous. This way he could elevate the Mimoregumi to a position of power and sabotage the Shogunate from the inside. And this is entirely a guess but I think he predicted the inevitability of Nobunobu selling out. So there were less risks in siding with the Hitotsubashi than if a different leader was in charge. Now the Tendosho did see his plan, but that was kind of unavoidable, considering they ordered the execution of his family. So it's only normal that they suspected him to a degree. You can't expect a guy who had his whole family killed by a faction to be loyal to that same faction. But Isaburo played his cards right most of the time. He took advantage of the fact that the Tendosho kept him alive, and he sided with the ambitious Hitotsubashi to eventually elevate the Memora Gumi to power. And he had the intelligence to know that Nobumei, or Mokuro as she was called, didn't actually kill his family and she could be a huge asset to him alive, turning one of the Tendosho's most lethal weapons against the state. He managed a successful facade of conflict with the Shinsengumi and the Joey Shishi in order to set his plans in motion with minimal resistance. And he used this illusion of being involved in the factional spat in order to make use of Gintoki's incredible skills, as we saw in the Korosin of a Nation arc. He was found out and killed right at the very end, but not only was that inevitable given his history, but it was too late once the Tendosho got rid of him. Isaburo successfully united the police forces and Katsura's Joey Shishi, and this is probably the strongest position any anti-government faction has been in since the Joey War. The only gripe I have with Isaburo's plan is that it required a large loss of life, such as in the Baragaki arc and the Farewell Shinsengumi arc on Kokujo Island, as well as the death and exploitation of several people under the Tokugawa and Hitotsubashi alike. So his plan required a lot of sacrifice within his nation, and it would be unfair if I took points away from Takasugi for making sacrifices like this, but not Isaburo for risking the lives of countless policemen and citizens to keep his plan intact. But what separates Isaburo from Takasugi is that Isaburo allied himself with the right people at the right times. There were sacrifices, but Isaburo clearly calculated this from early on. He knew the things that would have to be said and done to execute his plans but Isaburo kept his plan subtle and made the right strategic moves, rather than Takasugi who allied himself with anyone just for the sake of opposing the government, even when the alliance was clearly not beneficial for the Kihitai. So Isaburo had the smarts to understand who his real enemies were from fairly early in his career, and made the right moves rather than do something for the sake of maintaining his position or getting revenge. He thought things through with a clear head even in the most terrible of adversities, and through his clear and rational thinking, he managed to be one step ahead of the Tendosho even as they were killing him. Due to the severe loss of life his plan included, I can't consider him a perfect fit to be the leader. But that can't take away from the very intelligent and pragmatic strategies of Isaburo, which has given Japan a fighting chance of ousting the Tendosho and changing the nation. If he only had a little bit of luck on Kokujo Island, he could have survived and helped lead the rebellion. So with all this considered, in my own opinion, the two best choices for Gintama's Japan were Katsura and Isaburo. Katsura for his stance of moderation and his attempts to minimize the loss of life, and Isaburo for his intelligence and pragmatism while maneuvering through the political and military landscape of the nation. If Isaburo had stayed alive, the two could have been an ideal partnership to lead Japan out of Tendosho control and into a new era. But of the characters who are still with us, Katsura takes the cake as the best hope for Japan's future in the series. So that's my breakdown of Gintama's potential leaders. This is just my opinion and not meant to be some definitive statement on who's the best or most capable leader. I just think the topic is interesting and threw my two cents into it. Let me know what you all think. I would love to get a discussion going about it. Anyway, thank you for all the continued support. Follow me on Twitter if you like my content enough and take care.